So I'll get started and then I'll hand off to, to Mike here. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, this project has been running for 10 years. This is actually starting our 10th, 10th year of STEM guitar, but it actually, it actually it started a couple of years prior to, to when we were funded through the National Science Foundation. Back in 2006, Mike Akins and I uh, were involved in a grant project with Purdue University and several other regional community colleges here in the Midwest. And we were looking at the life cycle of a product, the birth to death. And uh, we couldn't figure out as a, as a team what product we could use to signify uh, the whole cycle. And so Dr. Mark French, when we were doing a visit at Purdue University said, hey, come on down, check out my lab. I've got it in this basement. And it truly was, it was in the catacombs of a, over a hundred year old building. And so we walked down there and it's dimly lit as you can imagine. Uh, the ceiling height was just what, five, about six feet. I mean, it was really low. And, but his students were going crazy building guitar, building guitar parts and uh, building acoustic guitars at that time. And Mike and I looked at each other and the light bulbs went off at that point and said, we can actually do this. This is, this is doable as a product and it's doable uh, as a next level. So that following year, uh, we sat down and wrote a grant project to the National Science Foundation. And there was four of us roughly that started the, the theory component behind this. And then we started to, to build a uh, fantastic team and you've met some of them and you'll see more of them later as part of our, um, uh, one of our other slides in terms of the, the team group. But the whole point is, is that just a small seed was planted and it continued to grow. Uh, the manufacturing component is based out of Sinclair Community College, which is my home base. Uh, and so we manufacture guitar kits that go out to schools around the United States and now into other countries also. And the whole premise behind this is that the National Science Foundation looks to have a sustainability component. How can we sustain this project beyond just our funding? And that is the point. The uh, manufacturing of the guitar kits is fully self-sustained. So that can go on indefinitely as long as Sinclair would like to host it. And then uh, the uh, workshops and the other uh, institute components that we keep developing are the National Science Foundation uh, tools that we're able to provide. Mike, would you like to talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing and kind of the timeline? Sure. I'll pick it up where BC3 was awarded the uh, the first STEM guitar grant. Uh, and I would say that, you know, Tom and everybody else on the call that's in the project, it really is something when, when you think about that four of us started writing this in Mark French's office t over 10 years ago. And we have 50, 50 over 55 people on a call and we have uh, a team of 20 some people. It's really, truly amazing. And, uh, it's a testament of a project that really works. But anyhow, in, 19, in 2009, uh, the college that I just retired from, Butler County Community College, was awarded the first NSF STEM guitar grant. And uh, we learned as we went, I can tell you that, from everything of how to qualify uh, participants to how to redesign the guitar and make the process a little bit better. Uh, our first summer, I think we had our first three workshops under the name of the uh, the STEM guitar uh, project. And during those workshops, as we were learning to build guitars, uh, uh, Tom's team and Doug Hunt went through a couple uh, neck designs. And the necks that you are be, will be working with now have been, I don't know what generation, four or five but we started off with baseball bats and we've ended up with some really well-designed necks. And, uh, and that's part of the whole continuous quality improvement that we kind of wrap around this project, whether it's building, whether it's the process, whether it's the curriculum, how we implement, how we turn over uh, the workshop. We're constantly, continually uh, trying to improve the quality of this uh, whole experience for you. In 2012, we did five more uh, workshops. And I would say by 
2012, word's kind of getting out. The, the, the STEM guitar project is really starting to get some momentum across the country. Uh, we got refunded in 2013. Uh, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, 2013, we were refunded. Uh, we continued the uh, summer institutes. Uh, as we continued to go back to the NSF for dollars, we had to continue to show them that we were going to new, do, do new and different things other than build guitars. Folks, the guitar is a hook. It's simply a hook to get kids and people interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. And what we told the NSF was that we were going to start collecting raw student data. And of course, they just thought that was the next best thing to slice bread, and everybody else is trying to do the same thing. Uh, uh, we got funded again. And Tom, I'll let you kind of wrap up the timeline here in this last round of funding and, uh, and bring this thing home. Great. So as we were funded in the 2013 um, environment and this ran for another four years and so we actually went through multiple iterations of design and and as mike indicated our whole focus is to continually produce a quality product a product that a student not only will be um, pleased about but actually can match up to what can be purchased in the store and that's part of the the whole process uh, and I have to, to uh, give kudos again to Doug Hunt. Doug's been our uh, design component uh, and provides uh, my production team with new concepts and new designs. And so as we continued along, we continued to add additional webinar, excuse me, additional summer institutes uh, each year preceded by a webinar. And uh, we actually received a new manufacturing facility at Sinclair in 2015. Uh, so we outgrew a storage closet area that we were actually producing guitars in, and they gave us a, an actual class space uh, that we were able to use. Well, at this point now in 2018, uh, we've pretty much doubled the amount of guitars that we're shipping. Uh, just in just the four, last four years, we've doubled uh, our shipments of guitars out of our lab. And so this past year, we, we shipped over 1,600 guitars to students and faculty. And so we see that continually growing. This year, it's going to be even higher. Um, and so it's, it, it is truly a testament to not only the longevity, but the, the capability of the project. This year, we were refunded. Uh, and that's based on the, the concept that we're going to be adding uh, topics such as CNC, which has direct employability skills. Well, the STEM guitar institutes have direct employability skills also. They're built into the, the structure of uh, the week-long training that you'll receive and then the training that you're going to be passing along to your students. So uh, you can take this back to your advisory committees and share with them the, the actual workforce skills, both hard and soft skills that, they're, that, that your students will be receiving and you'll be seeing uh, through that process. We have some more surprises uh, as we continue to move forward uh, in our project. We're not done designing and building new products. Um, look for something new to come out again next year. We're not in a position yet. We're just still in the testing phase, but uh, our goal is to have another new product out next year. So. Uh, it'll be another opportunity to get additional training uh, for an advanced level of guitar uh, fabrication. Uh, Sean, would you go ahead and index our slide forward? And so our project impact, so we talked a little bit about this, but we're actually in 48 states. And what that means is that we've shipped guitars to 48 United States um, over the last uh, 10 years. We've also trained 650 faculty. We've impacted over 23,000 students. We actually have, uh, we've trained faculty in Australia and in Canada. And Dr. French is now working on a collaborative project through Purdue University, uh, where he's actually instructing down in, in the University of Medellin in Colombia. So uh, this project has uh, tentacles and is growing not only nationally but also internationally. Let's go ahead and move forward, Sean. So Tim, why does this thing work? Well, why does it work? Uh, just short and sweet, it works because guitars are cool. And uh, Mike brought up, you know, that the guitars are the hook. 
And one of the things that I've seen, and I believe it's probably partially the purpose of the STEM guitar program, is the lure of the guitar draws students in who might not be STEM oriented or STEM confident. And over the time that they are in the course, they actually develop an appreciation for and some of them a real attraction to STEM studies. So to me, that's, that's the home run of this. And I've had a couple real solid examples. The very first semester I taught this, a uh, young guy named Todd, who was one of the few people who takes this course, who's actually a real guitar player. He was more of, a, of an artist type. And by the time he was done with this course, he said, Mr. Wilhelm, you know what I'm going to do when I get out of here? I said, no, Todd, what? I'm going to go get my bachelor's degree and be a high school physics teacher. So, boy, I'd home run there. And just this semester, uh, next week is final exam. This week was our last week of class. I had a lady in there who is a computer graphics design student, and, not, and she on her guitar, uh, we did something different than the standard uh, stem guitar electronics with volume, tone, and selector switch. We borrowed Bill Hempel from East Tennessee State University's Tone Monster electronics design, and uh, I helped her get that set up and bought some extra components. And she built a guitar that has six selectable tone capacitors and, and split pickups. And, and it's got like this infinite range of tonal qualities. But through the process of that, she's already got a bachelor's degree and, and two associate's degrees. She's decided she's going back to school again and going to get an associate's degree in electronics. So I think those kinds of things are what, what really makes it work. And it is, as it says up there on the slide, it is gender neutral, multicultural, and applicable to a wide range of ages, ages and abilities. I know there are junior highs that are teaching STEM guitar curriculum. I have had students at the community college level that range from high school juniors and seniors that come over to just to take a one class. Uh, and I did have one gentleman in there who was older than me. He was 70 years old. So wide ranges of abilities. Um, what I see on the gender neutral side is that we have in my classes that I've run probably about 35 to 45 percent of the class are female. This semester it was 50 percent of the class was female and I'm not going to comment too much on how the ladies guitars often are better than the guys but that kind of works out that way sometimes. Um, so those are reasons why it's also uh, the, the curriculum itself is uh, you've got multiple and flexible integration strategies that can be employed with this. Uh, you don't have to have a, a drop dead beautiful full blown Stu Mac style of, of guitar lab. Um, lots of ways to move this forward even without building guitars you can still use the curriculum. Uh, next slide please Sean. Um, one of the things that, that will happen is you will get a lot of publicity, not only um, outside, like through press releases and newspaper coverage and things like that, but in-house. Um, I leave the door open to our lab and people walking by, they can't help but stop because the room is full of enthusiasm. The students inside are fully engaged in creativity, but even better camaraderie. Um, students who, who weren't hardly talking to each other from, you know, from diverse backgrounds are all of a sudden best friends and they're helping each other and everybody is so curious about the, the artistic side of it. Like, what are you doing for your design and how are you doing this? And they help each other with, with soldering and tool use and things of that nature. It, it really is uh, something that, that has a high impact on, on the students. I also use social media to uh, to promote the class and have gotten a lot of new students that way. Something that just happened yesterday, I'd like to read a, a quick email and with a little background here. Um, our computer graphic design program at KCC just got a CNC router and the instructor didn't have a clue what to do with it. So he decided after I talked with him and bent his arm a little bit, He's building a CNC project into his Autodesk Inventor course, and the final project will be uh, drawing up 
copying one of the stem guitar body uh, designs, drawing it up in Inventor, and then creating the G code and cutting it out on the uh, CNC router as a prelude to taking the stem guitar course that we offer. Well, a couple days ago, we all have these textbook vendors that come into our offices and they want to uh, sell us textbooks. And um, what ended up happening was he took this textbook vendor over to see the CNC router because he's looking for a CNC textbook. And they, it happens to be in the guitar lab. She saw the guitars and he explained it to her and she sent him this email. Good morning, John. I just wanted to write a quick thank you for meeting with me yesterday. I've already texted all of my middle and high school science teachers about guitarbuilding.org. This was truly one of the coolest things in education I've ever seen. And then she goes on to thank him for meeting. But uh, I think that's some, some pretty decent uh, uh, attestment when you get a textbook vendor who's going to every school under the sun. They see a STEM guitar program and it's the coolest thing ever. And now they're telling everybody in junior high and high school that they know. Um, so I thought that was pretty neat. The other thing is it talks in the slide there about the low cost to get started. And it mentions a $500,000 startup cost if you're starting from scratch. I'd like to point out that's probably true if you go right into building. But we have, for example, a junior high in Indiana who started off with their STEM guitar course by picking up junk, trash, beat up, broken guitars. And they have their students take those guitars. They still study the curriculum through evaluating those guitars. And then they repaint them and repair them and put them into working condition with minimal tools and, and minimal supply. So there's lots of ways to get the ball rolling here and uh, turn a junkyard relics into uh, something the students can be excited about while learning all their STEM materials. Take it away, Sean. All right. Thanks, Sean and Tim. Um, I, Tim, I think you might have added a couple of zeros on the startup costs. So it's only about $5,000 if you start from scratch. So I don't want to give anyone, um, you know, heart attacks. Um, so as Tim mentioned, there's lots of things changing uh, with STEM and STEM education on the national stage. And Tim talked a lot about problem-based learning and project-based learning. And so on the national landscape, the standards are shifting towards the next generation science standards as well as the Common Core. And when we first started the grant about 10 years ago, we didn't have those national standards and we were just not in a position to align our curriculum to all 50 states. Um, so we left that to the teachers who are participating in those workshops. But since we do have more or less national standards that states are in the process of adopting or adapting um, to adopt those, we are aligned with the next generation science standards and uh, the common core standards. And we encourage our teacher participants to align their modular learning activities that they develop uh, throughout the week to align them. Sean, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is just a sample of the next generation science standards. And so there are four parts to the next gen science standards. They're the student performance expectations that students are going to be expected to um, know the material and demonstrate that they know the material in an authentic way. And those performance expectations are made up of three parts. The science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts, which are the overarching uh, themes that hold the science and engineering practices and disciplinary core ideas. So our grant and our project is perfectly positioned to mix the science and engineering content with the practices through problem and project-based learning. And also, if you look at the next-gen science standards, they're great. Um, they also include the Common Core um, math standards as well. Um, but we're also linked to those. And Sean, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, that is all for the standards. We're going to talk about the expectations of participants with Tom. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Debbie. I know the state of Ohio is actually pushing engineering kind of standards fairly low, even into middle schools at this point. So it's becoming a, a larger and larger task um, for faculty at all levels to integrate uh, STEM learning. 
So what are the expectations of participants during our institutes? And we need to develop, uh, or the participants will develop a modular learning activity for your classroom. And so during the week, while, while you're going through the, both the hands-on learning and the classroom uh, learning components, uh, you'll be working on your uh, structure of your module learning activity. And so there's always a lot of questions about, well, how long does it have to be? And, you know, it's just like if uh, I set a writing assignment out for my students, you know, they want to know exactly how many words that the assignment has to be. And when you give them the open-ended discussion, um, they don't know how to handle it in many ways. And so the, the idea is we need to have a module that, that could uh, branch at least one session of class. Uh, the whole idea is about a 50 minute session is pretty common across the United States. And, and our goal here is to share this with all the other teachers that are out there that are applying uh, this particular uh, set of tools. And so your module will ultimately get vetted through uh, our team and then ultimately published as part of our modular uh, activities. We provide a template, so the, uh, the whole idea is you're not totally out on the island. We also encourage team development. If you want to partner with another uh, team member during the, the institute, that's perfectly A-OK -okay with us. The idea is that we want everybody to start thinking about how this can be applied in their current classroom. And, and we understand that it could take up to a year for it to actually happen. Uh, things move slowly in the educational arena. So how can you apply the MLA now as part of your normal, or part of your typical curriculum um, rotation, even though you might not be building an instrument immediately? And so that's part of the, the whole aspect. We'll be looking at implementation options. And so that's usually where we get a lot of questions is, well, how, how do you implement? And the, the beauty about this project and this program is that we don't specify a specific way that it has to be implemented. We have schools that implement it as after school, as incentive programs for students to take certain coursework tracks. Uh, we have this being implemented as a, uh, or within a math or a science course. We have it implemented as part of a CTE instruction to help keep the CTE viable so it's teaching STEM topics and STEM curriculum that match with the math and science instruction on the campus. And so there's, there is no one successful way. There are many successful ways for it to be implemented. You're going to, you're, during the week, you're going to experience at least two module learning activities, our term for MLAs. Um, in that you'll be actually uh, doing, you'll be starting one for homework here um, this week uh, f uh, that you'll turn in during the Institute, but there'll be at least two more during the Institute that we'll be covering with you as part of uh, the learning environment. We're gonna cover all STEM, all four STEM topics. And so the idea is that uh, we try to, to leave or try to equally I shouldn't say equally because sometimes it is a little bit heavier on the science physics side uh, and on the math side than the engineering side. So the whole idea is that there is all four parts of the STEM environment that we'll be looking at. You're going to build a playable guitar in five days and we've done it a lot. And so we can say that even if you've never touched any tools, you'll be successful. And this is a group environment. So we try to make sure that the group uh, works together and learns together uh, ultimately. And at the very end, we're gonna actually have everybody peer review uh, another guitar. And this begins the process of understanding how to evaluate the instrument. And the evaluation component uh, we're working on is something new and, and uh, it's not ready for prime time just yet, but we're working on uh, an electronic way to capture uh, this guitar rubric data uh, that you'll be evaluating. And so ultimately uh, you'll be looking at somebody else's, and again, as the instructors will be around to assist, uh, but the idea is to, 
to have you do something very similar that you're going to be doing to your student guitars as they finish them up. Go ahead and move forward, Sean. And so what is in, what, what is in it for you? Um, obviously, you're going to build the custom electronic guitar within five days, and you'll be successful, no question. Uh, you're going to receive the curriculum to use in your class. Matter of fact, the curriculum is up on guitarbuilding.org right now. You're welcome to grab it and use it and check it all out. Uh, you're going to receive a, a direct fellowship package of at least $1,400 in value, $300 stipend, and that includes uh, a differential on uh, lunch uh, costs. We, we can't directly pay for lunch, but it's built into the, the cost here. Um, you'll receive a support package, and you'll receive more information upon the support package at the workshop. And it covers all of our costs as the trainers, uh, the equipment fees, the, the guitar kits, all that's covered through the National Science Foundation grant. And so ultimately, it adds up to a value of over $1,400. Go ahead and move on. And so at the end of the uh, Institute season. Uh, this is going to be uh, early in August. Uh, we'll, begin a, we'll begin a uh, startup opportunity. And so as part of our grant, we've built in the opportunity to um, have faculty apply for startup grants. And so this is a competitive process. And uh, the idea is that this competitive uh, process of receiving a startup grant ensures that the individuals that receive the grant are actually going to apply it. And Mike, Mike can uh, speak about the first grant that in our first grant, we actually did give away, everybody received, uh, I think it was five guitars. But we also learned that a lot of guitars just sat in the corner. And so we don't like seeing uh, the potential playable instruments not being utilized for that educational benefit. So we've ultimately moved to a, uh, an application competitive startup opportunity. The value of these is significant. Um, you're going to receive guitar kits, you'll receive tools, you receive sandpaper. Um, it's, it's pretty much everything that you need to, uh, to get started uh, with a small class or with a pilot program. What it requires you to do, though, uh, is more than just completing the Summer Institute. Uh, you'll have to implement two MLA activities that uh, are shared online, which means that any of the activities that we've already created uh, and have published, you're, you need to utilize and, and document the utilization. Uh, you're gonna, you're going to need your to test your MLA in your class that you developed during the summer institute. Again, you're going to need to document that testing of your MLA. You're going to need to receive a letter of commitment of implementation uh, that's going to be submitted with your student surveys based on the MLA activities. So uh, there'll be surveys that you'll be completing as part of that, or there'll be student surveys that you'll be completing as part of that MLA activity environment and you'll submit it, that letter of commitment, and you have to have a space to build guitars in. Um, what we're going to do is have our applications due January 30th, 2019 for this year. That will give you the whole fall season. And again, it's not about actually building the instrument. This is all about utilizing some of the modular activities in your classroom and testing uh, some of the interactive capabilities. Along with that, you'll have your guitar in the classroom to be used as a uh, great tool uh, and hook to connect directly to those MLA components. And if you have other questions, we'll be happy to, uh, to address those also. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So surveys and data collection. Uh, you'll be receiving surveys uh, from our evaluation team, and uh, those will typically uh, show up as a mid-year evaluation and end-of-year evaluation, and we're going to continue to do yearly follow-ups. Uh, there'll also be daily institute surveys that you'll be creating. So when you're on site for the five days, it, it's kind of like a blog kind of thing, but it's also a skills assessment. Uh, so it's, it's a hybrid a survey that we're going to be using. And I've already mentioned the guitar grading rubric that you're going to be evaluating 
uh, one of your other participant uh, guitars uh, with that. It, uh, go ahead and move on. So Mike, we have the uh, meet the team now. Okay, uh, I think what I'm gonna do here, folks, is uh, I'm gonna go through the team, but uh, a half a dozen of us are on the call, and I think they did a, a much better job introducing themselves than I probably will. So I'm gonna just go through all the team members, but the ones that have introduced themselves already, I'm gonna move past those. Uh, just on the slide is Tom Singer. Now he would argue that, he, that he's there first because he's the best looking, but I don't know. Uh, but, and, and beside Tom is Mel Cosette. Mel is the PI of the National Science uh, Foundation ATE uh, Center, uh, Matt Ed, which is dedicated to uh, materials education. And she's in Linwood, Washington at Edmonds Community College. And myself uh, is uh, beside Mel. And then we have Mark French. And Dr. French, you could really say Dr. French kind of fathered this whole idea. As Tom mentioned on the timeline, Tom and I attended a workshop, his first guitar workshop at Purdue, an enthusiast guitar workshop. And as we were building these guitars, the light bulb was, you know, lighting in our heads and we knew that we were on to something. So Mark really paved the way. And Mark is a professor of mechanical engineering technology at Purdue University. Uh, he runs a guitar making lab at Purdue and has worked on projects for several major manufacturers over the years. Mark has authored more than 100 technical publications, including the books Engineering the Guitar and Technology of the Guitar, which we will mention later. And uh, uh, beside Mark is Dr. Debbie French, no relation. Uh, Debbie did introduce herself, and uh, I'll just move on then. And beside Debbie is Doug Hunt. Doug Hunt teaches engineering and technology courses at Southern Wells uh, Junior Senior High School in Indiana. Doug is an excellent guitar player, has been playing for 30 years and been building guitars for over 12 years. And besides teaching the summer, uh, the summer uh, institutes and many, many other duties in our project, as Tom had said earlier, uh, Doug has done extensive work on the neck profile and uh, on a lot of the redesigns of, uh, of our uh, guitar necks and bodies. And there's Steve Wendell there. Steve Wendell's the director of the NCME at Sinclair Community College, National Center for Manufacturing Excellence. Uh, and Kevin Murphy uh, is out of uh, Edmonds as well. And Kevin's our marketing and program project development specialist. Uh, Kevin has a unique capacity to connect the guitar project and the workshop with suitable uh, community partners, including school districts, media outlets, and local music industry. And then uh, beside uh, Kevin is uh, Dr. Amelda Castaneda Enemaker. And uh, Amelda is our external evaluator, a project under the NSF, a million dollar project, which is what this is. Uh, a portion of your budget is dedicated to evaluation to make sure that you are uh, running down the rails of the track that you said you were going to run down. And Amelda keeps us honest. Uh, and uh, really glad to have her. And then beside Imelda is Scott Robbie. Scott Robbie just retired from Venture Community College and where he is now an adjunct professor in manufacturing and design. Uh, and beside uh, Scott Robbie is Steve Brown. Steve will be here with me in Nevada for the workshop. Uh, so will Mark uh, French, by the way. And Steve is a professor of applied technology at the College of the Redwoods in Eureka, uh, Northern California, and he is one of these uh, original STEM guitar founding members as well. Of course, there's Sean, and uh, you know, I don't know what funding cycle it was, but uh, it became very apparent to us that we needed, uh, uh, we needed a, a digital expert and uh, somebody to, to make things work for us digitally and online, and Sean has been the best. And he's also in the, in the process of uh, pursuing his, uh, uh, his PhD. And then there's Nancy Chang, and I believe Nancy introduced herself as well. Uh, you know, the great thing is I introduce these people, folks, you know, Debbie, Doug, Sean, Nancy, uh, all of these people were attendees at one point or another of these workshops that we do, and they just became champions, and they championed this whole idea and now they're they're part of the team and uh we're real proud of that 
Um, beside Nancy is Dave Parker. Dave is a retired high school physics teacher. He's a former mechanical engineer and chemist. Uh, he brought the STEM guitar project to his high school, Noble High School, uh, up in uh, New England, uh, to better support students who love music but feared math and science. Uh, Dave's got a wonderful accent, and he just recently completed the design and building of his retirement boat, a solar electric catamaran. Uh, and then beside Dave is Norm. Norm Geiger enjoyed a long career at Northeast Arizona as a science teacher for Ganado High School on the Navajo Nation. There he implemented a STEM guitar class, recently retired. He keeps himself busy working part-time for his old school, guiding the Rhodes Scholar, staying involved with the STEM guitar project and traveling. Uh, that next good looking fellow there is Tim Wilhelm. Uh, Tim has spoken and introduced himself. Uh, and beside Tim is Ed. You're gonna hear more from Ed. Uh, and then uh, the next person is Reno. Uh, Mazuko is a professor of electronic technology and engineering uh, technology at Mesa Community College, uh, where he's been doing this for over 23 years. Uh, he's just recently brought guitar building into the college and uh, is starting to do other things like uh, creating pedals and it looks like they built their first five watt tube amp. And then after uh, Reno is Alex Mole. Alex has been teaching in Lake Stevens, Washington for over 20 years. He's been running the Lake Stevens Middle School wood shop for seven years and started an after school guitar building club six years ago. Again, folks, we will talk about this more on this call. We'll talk about it more in person. There are so many ways to get this thing started at your school. Uh, Chad McCormick is next. Chad joins the team after five years of teaching STEM guitar courses at Wells High School in Wells, Maine, and more than a decade of building guitars of his own design. This year, Chad has taken on a new position of teaching math and guitar building. And then we have Alan. Alan introduced himself earlier. He's got a great voice for radio, I'll tell you. He really does. Actually, I always tell him he's got a great face for radio. No, I should I can only say that because I'm up. And then we have Matt. Uh, Peachman, a technology education teacher at Penridge High School with Allen. Uh, during his teaching career, he's taught woodworking, metalworking, graphic arts, drafting, architecture, construction, and various introduction to technology courses. Matt helped his department at, uh, uh, at, at Penridge High School win the Program of Excellence Award uh, for Pennsylvania uh, for 2017. And then there's James Cordoa, Cordoro, Cordero, excuse me, who is our videographer and our traveling photographer. And I must tell you folks, I'm humbled to, uh, to introduce all these people to you because over 10 years ago it was three or four people thinking about this idea. And now we have, everybody that I've introduced is literally is a champion. It's somebody that has taken this project and they've gotten, you know, other teachers excited. And if teachers are excited, kids are excited. And it's a, it's a real privilege to introduce this team to you, and you are in good, good hands. Mike, if I may, I, I believe we accidentally skipped over Dave Lake. Oh, no, not Dave Lake. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I appreciate that. No and Dave Lake, uh, thanks, is a teacher of industrial arts and engineering drafting at uh, Kiona Benton City High School in the state of Washington. Uh, he's been there for 22 years. He implemented guitar building in 2012 as an integrated and has integrated ukulele and acoustic guitar building into the curriculum. And he and Ed Uford work uh, very closely together. And Dave and Ed will be conducting one of the CNC workshops uh, out in Washington, uh, the same time that uh, Alan and Matt will be conducting theirs. So thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. And uh, it's a privilege to introduce a, a, a group of people like this to you folks online. It really is. Hi, everybody. So um, be, before I tell you about uh, what to expect this summer at your institute, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what you can do now to get the most out of the experience of your summer build. Um, I'm going to be going eventually going over uh, a variety of items from workspaces to what to wear and that sort of thing. So um, 
the way to get the most out of the Guitar Building Institute um, is really about kind of about your comfort and what you can do to prepare. Um, the pictures on this slide are um, significant to me. The one by the Space Needle, I'm the third person from the right at the bottom, and that was the first um, institute I attended as a volunteer for the project before I was added on as a full-time member. So um, that was a really great experience. And the picture on the right of the student holding up his swirl dipped guitar, that was just about a week ago. So that's how far I've come in six years through this project. And it is, it for those of you that are attending for the first time this summer, I'm so excited because it will change how you think about education and teaching. For many of us, it was a career reviving decision to attend our first institute. Um, so next slide, Sean. So the first thing you can do is your homework, okay? And when as teachers, you know, we probably say that a lot. Um, later in the presentation, Tom is gonna, and Mike are gonna be going over specific, you know, homework you're gonna be assigned. But in to addition to that, I highly recommend that if you haven't done so already, you explore the website and, you know, familiarize yourself with where things are at and how that navigates. And Sean's gonna talk about that in a few minutes too. Um, if you, you may have noticed there are lots of videos on the site on how to build. We're also in the process of kind of updating some of those, but the ones there are great for each step of the build. We use them all the time at our program. And another thing you can do is just, you know, think about how this is going to look in your classroom. You know, well, there's different levels of implementation. Some people bring it into their existing classroom as, you know, using the um, modular learning activities to integrate into their existing curriculum. And, you know, other people do full blown, you know, standalone classes. And another thing you can do, uh, you will be expected to um, come up with some learning uh, modular learning activities yourself. They're basically lesson plans at the Institute, but you'll need to know your state's learning standards if they're different from what we have. We, um, ours are aligned to Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, you know, just knowing where to find them is also good enough. All right, next slide. Um, we found too that it really helps to kind of set a goal. And this is an extension of what I mentioned earlier, and I think um, Tom mentioned this earlier too, is there is a wide variety of ways to implement. Not everybody, you know, has a wood shop or a workshop to use to have a team, a, a group of 20 kids build a guitar. Um, we started out at our school um, in, in Seattle with, um, just using an old abandoned locker room was our space. We didn't even have hardly any tools or anything. And um, that worked out for about a year until we got kicked out of that space. Then we hauled all of our kids up to the community college in our area and borrowed a space from them for a few years. And now we finally have our own space on our um, campus, but it's a former loading dock. So it's not ideal, but we're just happy to have a space there. So even if you don't have a great you know wood shop already in place there are ways you can still build and the picture I mentioned earlier where I'm standing outside uh, the Space Needle that build was done at a rock and roll museum we have here in Seattle and they just used folding tables and you know hauled everything in to do the build and so every time my teaching partner Kathy and I felt discouraged we thought you know they built guitars at the EMP museum so I think we can do it here Next slide. This is probably for me like the most important <laughs> tip I can say is it's you know you need to maybe be aware of um, the the weather in the area you're going to be in. Um, I built my first guitar in Eastern Washington with Ed Ufford and Dave Lake in Richland at Hanford High and. You know, it was like 150 degrees the whole time, boiling hot outside, but the shop was air conditioned. So you were always going from super hot to freezing cold and things like that. Sometimes the classroom area you'll be in is air conditioned and the shop is not. So be aware of, you know, be prepared for those kind of things. The first few days, especially you're going to, it's going to be sweaty no matter what. There's a lot of physical labor involved in sanding. Um, 
the first day when I built my first guitar at, I mean, I was almost in tears because my arm ached from sanding because I'm not used to doing uh, any physical labor whatsoever as a math teacher. <laughs> and anyway, I got through it and it was well worth it. Um, you're definitely going to want closed toed shoes, you know, no open sandals or flip flops that doesn't fly in a, in a wood shop. And you're, you know, you want clothes you can move in, obviously, and layers are great. Um, also, you want to, uh, if you want to bring your own safety equipment. We have a limited amount of things people can borrow, but we recommend safety glasses, hearing protection. Sometimes when all of the machines are going, it can get pretty loud. And dust protection that you can wear over your face. It does get very dusty. Next slide. Okay, so a typical day at the Guitar Building Institute. Um, a lot has been said so far about what to expect. Um, the, the, mo the most exciting thing, of course, is you're going to walk away with a custom electric guitar that you built yourself. And it's just, um, as I've already said, it's, I, for me, it was a life-changing experience. I never thought I could build something like that. And I was just very proud of my accomplishment. It, it changed how I thought about myself just as a teacher and, and even as a person, which sounds weird to say, but you'll see this summer when, <laughs> when you do your guitar. You're also going to be designing your own lesson plans or activities that you can use right away with your students. And um, your time is gonna be divided. Every day we spend time in a classroom where um, you'll want to have a laptop or a tablet or some kind of uh, device that you can access the internet and look at videos on the website and you know look up learning standards and things like that. Um, and then we will also spend a good amount of time in the shop and you'll be not only just you know sanding and assembling things but you're also going you know you will design your own headstock you do all your own fretting and fret dots we'll be soldering the electronics um, the finishing will involve either swirl painting a guitar or um, putting on a shine with tongue oil you'll be doing all your own assembly and you'll learn how to do intonation and um, yeah next slide <laughs> So this slide shows a list of all of the institutes we're doing this summer, including the instructional faculty. So I'm just gonna summarize this here. In Oklahoma, the site leader is Dave Parker, and he will be assisted by Norm Geiger and Scott uh, Robbie. In Nevada will be Mike as the site leader with Steve Brown and Reno. In Connecticut, the site leader is Dave Parker again, and Mark and Sean. In um, Minnesota, it, Tom will be the site leader and Chad will be assisting him. In San Francisco, California will be Steve Brown and me and Alex. And in Kentucky, Doug Hunt will be the site leader assisted by Tim and Debbie. There will also be for the first time ever, two summer CNC institutes and we are super excited about this. This is a really big deal for us and I'm so happy that so many of you are going to be attending that. I wish I could attend it as well and I will eventually. Anyway, in Richland, Washington um, will be Eddie and Dave Lake and in Pennsylvania, Alan and Matt. Next slide. Cool, thank you Nancy. So um, hopefully everyone's gotten a chance to see the website already. There's a ton of information on the website. In fact, some of our team members, I notice sometimes call our project guitarbuilding.org. So it's, it's got a lot of information, so I'm not going to go through everything. But I do want to point out two pieces, and I also encourage you to just kind of explore all the tabs and check it out uh, prior to the institutes this summer. Um, the first one I want to point to is under the community tab, there's a link to our forum. So as Tom mentioned, there's hundreds of schools. Uh, in 48 states and four countries implementing this curriculum. So registering for the forum here in the bottom left-hand corner is really an opportunity for you to see what other people are talking about within the community and to post your own questions. And you can even contact us and ask to start a whole other topic area if you like. So I encourage all of you to go out and register for the forum today if you haven't already done so. Again, that's under the community tab here and it's the forum link on our guitarbuilding.org website. Secondly, I encourage you to go to the, under the Teach tab to the Institute page. And within there, um, 
uh, Debbie and Tom already mentioned that there's some homework that you're going to be doing that Tom's going to re reference here in a few minutes. And you're going to find that under the modular learning activities. So that will, this link here on the Institute page will allow you to download all of that information and view all of the MLAs as well as uh, see the ones we're referencing today. And you'll notice here this link after today, the 2017 recording will be replaced with the 2018 recording. And I noticed there was a question earlier about can you share that with administrators and people like that at your school? Absolutely, this just has information about the grant. So uh, this is public on our website, so feel free to reference that and share it as you wish. Mike, you wanna jump on board and take a little bit of the anatomy? Sure. Uh, the assignment that we are uh, talking about with you folks is for you to come prepared with the guitar anatomy and cost estimate activity. This is one of our core exercises. And as far as uh, teaching goes, this is a great place to start with your students. That's why we start with you. Uh, the activity itself is, and I'll show you here in a minute, but the activity is online. And you, uh, you'll read the activity. It's gonna ask you to create a spreadsheet and you're basically going to go down the diagram and you're going to pick the pieces and parts of the guitar, put it in a spreadsheet, and come prepared to talk about that on uh, Monday, uh, you know, mid-morning. Mid uh, under the guitar, or excuse me, under the teach tab of our website, guitarbuilding.org, there is modular learning activities link and when you click on that you'll have an opportunity to download all of the learning activities as well as the answers um, and with that will be this specific activity uh, the real purpose of this is so that you and when you do this with your students they'll have a frame of reference of what a tuner is or what a strap button is or what a jack is or what a pickup is or what's a bridge. Um, and that's really the, the purpose of doing this. Uh, on this uh, particular screen, you can see what our typical gu guitar kit looks like. It's uh, you know on the right-hand uh, picture there. Another reason we do this is uh, when your students do this, and in my class, I, 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 I let them pick anything they wanted. I mean, they, their guitar could cost thousands of dollars. I didn't really care. But what was really nice is once they realized what they were paying for the guitar kit, because at the college, they had to pay for the guitar kit, and, they, and then they saw what kind of guitar parts they spec'd out, it was a little bit of a reality check that they're getting a guitar at a pretty decent cost. Um, Tom, you want to add anything here? Uh, not much. Uh, you covered it very well, Mike. Ultimately, this is this is a good way to to ensure that we have a common knowledge level as we walk into the room on Monday. Uh, so that way, uh, everybody can identify parts and has a better uh, overall scope of knowledge uh, for. Uh, the activity. Go ahead and move to the next slide. And so as you're doing the uh, homework websites and uh, the idea is that uh, you'll go out and research the part costs and these part costs can be found and there's literally hundreds of guitar part websites out there. Uh, it, it, the whole idea is that you want to be able to replicate this. So, um, you know, there's no buddy deals and things like that. Uh, that, that we uh, have you put in. However, uh, the same that we go through for your students. So when your students go through this exercise of doing a, a basic uh, cost analysis, their feedback, and you, you can then do class averages of what the guitar costs are. And I know in one of my last classes, it came up to be over $600 for all the guitar parts uh, of what they uh, cost out at. And so the idea is that they'll find the value of the instrument and the perceived value of the instrument will increase based on the knowledge of all the individual parts. Go ahead and move forward. Hey, Tom, can I add yes. something? Can I Go add for something? it. 
Absolutely. Uh, if you go back to that slide, Sean. Hey, hey folks, uh, when you go to do this activity, and I think Sean has already talked about it or is going to talk about it, you need to get kind of comfortable with our website. We're going to use that a lot when, when you come to the institutes. And we don't mind fielding questions. We really don't. And this learning activity is exactly where we said it is on this slide. <laughs> you know? uh, so I guess what I'm saying is you would really be doing yourself a favor to get familiar with the website, where the learning activities are, and what resources you have before you get before you get to your institute location. Thanks, Tom. Tim? Sure. Um, what to look forward to in your classroom. I'm going to jump to question three there. What challenges did you have to overcome? I think there are some common needs that everybody has to have at some level or another to go forward with this. And each of those needs constitutes a, a challenge or a potential barrier. And those are administrative support, financial support, and space. And so if you think about those three things, you can often end run them before they become a problem. Uh, one of the things that I did at my end was um, I started rounding up tool donations. I, I found out there are quite a few old guys like me who have really been into woodworking and they're getting into their 80s and, and they're not using their shop anymore and they'd love to see their cherished woodworking tools and, and shop equipment go to something like this where you can get young students engaged in, in project-based learning and, and it sort of leaves a little bit of a legacy for them. And, and I've found a lot of these people are very um, willing to make a donation like that. So that's one way to overcome the budget side. Administrative support, one thing I did was I talked the dean of our division into attending one of these summer institutes like y'all are getting ready to go into. And holy cow, he was sold after that. And because he talked it up, with the vice president of the college, the vice president of the college, we talked him into actually enrolling in the full semester course as a student. And I've had nothing but administrative support since then. So there's lots of ways to get your administrator on board. And then um, space is, is a challenge. You heard Nancy say she started in a closet, I think somewhere. And uh, we had something bigger than a closet, but uh, not a whole lot, but eventually they allowed us to, uh, take over the old machine shop, which was pretty greasy, and I did some power washing and painting in there to get it cleaned up. But there's ways of overcoming the challenges if you think about those three things. Now, impacts and, and triumphs for students. Um, some of it is somewhat dramatic. My, my first semester I taught STEM guitar course, at the end of the semester, a student came up to me who was um, a, a guitar player, one of the few again that we've had, and and he brought his guitar up to the front of the room and he said quietly, Mr. Wilhelm, thank you for saving my life. And I said, what in the world are you talking about? And he said, you've got to understand, you know, my dad bailed when, when I was little and I didn't have um, any kind of, of tutelage. And I, I came in here not really knowing how to hold a screwdriver correctly. And by the time he got done learning how to use a bandsaw and power sanders and hand tools, he held up his guitar and he said, look what I've done. Look what I've done. He said, I feel like now that I've done this, I can go out and do anything. Um, a couple of semesters ago, I had a lady in her mm, probably early 40s come in and take the course. And she was not a guitar player, but her father was. And she and her father had um, a pretty rough relationship her whole life. And uh, he was a, a guitar bar band player, country bar band player. And uh, she wanted to try to figure out a way to connect with her dad. So she decided the guitar she was building was going to be a gift for him for Father's Day. And Father's Day came after the semester was done. And she gave him this big box. He opened it up and, and said, you bought me a guitar for Father's Day? And she said, no, Dad. I built you a guitar and she handed him the class portfolio, which showed step-by-step -step photos of the process of her building the guitar. And she said, 
It was the first time in her life she ever saw her father cry, and now it's the only guitar he plays. And just this semester, and this was just a few days ago, um, I had a young lady who is a fine art student take the STEM guitar course, and uh, she was very nervous about doing a quality job because her decision was she's a starving artist. She needed to sell the guitar that she made. And so when she was all done with everything, including intonation, she asked me if I would play it. And as I started to play her guitar, she started to cry. And she was so moved by the fact, oh, my gosh, look what I've done. And fortunately for her and surprising to me, and I think my compadres here are going to have a hard time believing this, within two days she sold it on some website where she had previously sold some of her artwork. And an engineer from New York bought her guitar for $2,000. And I didn't goof that number up. My apologies for the $500,000, but, but it really was $2,000. Uh, she has got the money in her account right now. So those are some pretty interesting impacts. And I mentioned before the, uh, the real camaraderie that builds with the students and, and the joy and creativity that seems to roll out the doorway. So those are the kinds of things you can expect.